We move on now to panel three, which is going to look at developing innovation and creativity for sustainable governance practices. Our panelists are Dr. Vishnu Balgobin, Mrs. Eleanor Jones, and Anjan McLean. So I will introduce each of them um, in a few minutes. I just wanted to uh, convey apologies from Vashti Gayadin, the CEO of TTCSI, who was scheduled to be the moderator for this session. She unfortunately had an emergency that she had to deal with, but um, we wish her all the best with, with dealing with that. Um, in the interim, I will stand in, in her place as moderator for this final panel for this evening, which I know is going to be filled with a lot of incredible information and sharing as we have seen all day as well. So I'll start first with the introduction of uh, Dr. Vishnu Balgobin, who is a get things done leader and a visionary with over 20 years of experience in business development, strategy execution, organizational transformation, shared services, supply chain and commercial management. He is passionate about exploring and implementing new techniques and technologies that drive business improvement. Vishnu has a doctorate in business management from the Swiss Management Center, a master's in project management from the University of the Western East, a certificate in law from the University of London, and a bachelor's in management and finance from UE. Our second uh, panelist is joining us from Jamaica, and she is Mrs. Eleanor Jones, an international environmental risk management and development professional with significant experience in the fields of environmental best practice, disaster risk management, climate resilience building, and sustainable development. She is someone who has served at several local and international boards and has been widely recognized and awarded locally and internationally for her work in environmental risk management systems and with civil society. And our third panelist, Anjan McLean, who is the Chief Risk Officer at Massey Holdings Limited. Anjan has a master's degree in financial management from Middlesex University London and is a graduate of UE with a BSc in management studies. She is also certified in Lean Six Sigma at a black belt level, risk management and change management through the uh, ProSci organization. So um, we have three very learned panelists here who today are going to share with us in terms of how we can develop innovation and creativity within our organizations to build sustainable governance practices. So Vishnu, if I may ask you to go first and let's hear your thoughts. I know you have a, a lot of experience um, in terms of bringing really innovative practices um, to help businesses grow. So let's hear from you. Thanks, Kamala. And again, thank you for inviting me to Governance Week. It's my first time joining you guys. And it's a pleasure being here. And um, I know you say hoping to learn a lot from you, but I'm actually hoping to learn a lot more from the discussions from the other panelists because it's been interesting as I dropped in and participated in the other sessions. And um, you know, I just want to acknowledge it has been a long day and with the challenges on the electricity and um, uh, the weather, I want to thank everyone who has remained. And hopefully we can make it a very interesting topic because we, I think we got um, the best lot looking at creativity and innovation, which is a lot of the times looking at what's new. So hopefully, let's hope we can make it interesting. Now, over the past two days and earlier today, we learned quite a bit about the circular economy. Um, even myself, and who knew it in theory, as you listen to some of the previous panelists and the discussions, you know, you, you understand, and we're finally coming to a realization that we can't continue with our count current way of being as we're facing irreversible climate changes, environment pollution, um, increasing resource scarcity, which is driving up the cost of materials and production. Uh, I mean, personally being in the energy industry over the past couple of years, we've seen I mean, uh, material increase 
almost 100, 200%. Um, and it's particular concern to us in the Caribbean because we don't have a lot of raw materials. It is actually getting harder to do business um, and even uh, worse to be able to, um, to export what we do because we're facing uh, countries that have uh, greater supply of raw materials, uh, cheaper supply at times. Now, the circular economy, and we've discussed it and touched on it before, is really moving away from the conventional linear end of life concept for a product. You know, it's based on reducing, reusing, uh, creating multiple value chain from the main value chain, you know, whether it's in the production, the distribution, or the consumption, um, with the aim of accomplishing sustainable economic growth um, for the current and future generations. Now, the challenge is, and um, it may seem daunting because we're talking about uh, what many people might call an ideal. Um, it's, and, and within the Caribbean, we have some unique challenges um, and particularly pursuing the sustainable economy because it's not, we're not all looking at it or in the same position as entities. Um, and I mean, uh, Mark spoke about it earlier in the previous session that a lot of these initiatives require capital and a lot of companies are start for capital and we're not attracting foreign divest in, uh, foreign direct investment in the region as we used to. Um, so that's a challenge for us. Culture, we are as a people, corporate wise, very hesitant. And you know, my two other panelists here, um, Angela and Eleanor deals with risk and um, myself spending quite a number of years in the corporate environment, you always see the risk in doing something. And there's always a tendency to sticking with what works, what has worked, or doing things the way it's always been done. Um, so that has been a challenge for us as, as, uh, as companies. We also have um, a lack of information. Um, I'm not sure if how many of us would have ever had to look at uh, getting information out of um, the central statistics office of any one of the islands that we have. It's very difficult to find out what is being brought into the uh, country, what is being manufactured, what is being exported. So if you're trying to do something uh, in sustainability, um, uh, try to substitute an import or, an, uh, or increase an export, you just don't have the information to make those de decisions. That's a huge um, stumbling block for us. We also have challenges. Now, although in the previous, um, session right before, we heard about, uh, Ian spoke about some of the, the collaboration that's happening across the, the region. Um, and it ended on a note of collaboration. However, uh, culture, I don't think there's enough. I don't think there's a, not enough intercompany, interindustry, intercountry communication relationship that will allow some of the uh, efficiencies that's needed for a sustainable future. Um, we also are territorial as a people. Uh, for a lot of the companies that I've been with, um, pri and primarily the private ones as well, we've also been so guarded about our information. You know, this is what we have. This is what we need to protect to maintain our competitive advantage. If we share our information, um, you know, we are going not going to be sustainable. We're not going to um, survive in this way. So that prevents a lot of collaboration from really happening. And also um, within the region, we find that there's a lack of ownership, a uh, lot of, and it was uh, touched on, there is no synergistic governmental intervention or organization or association. And uh, Nigel spoke about it in the last session there as well, when he closed off and saying that there's a lot of scope for the TTME, the TTCSI, um, even the energy chamber to step up and try to push some of these agendas or push it in the correct direction. Now, I know it, it could sound like I started on a negative path and a lot of things that is, you know, uh, hampering the move towards uh, sustainable energy. I'm, I'm saying energy because of that industry I'm in, but a sustainable future um, filled with innovation and creativity. But the, real, the reality is it's only by turning towards creativity and embracing creativity that we can move out of this and we can overcome some of these issues because creativity fosters innovation. 
Now, not all creativity leads to innovation, but for our uh, purpose, if we bring something new to an industry, now it doesn't have to be novel, it doesn't have to be something that's never been done before, it just has to be something new to that industry, new to that company that would introduce a new way of doing things that will increase productivity, that would allow the company to be in a space of working smarter instead of harder. You know, that's real creativity and innovation. And some of the, um, and that's where the creativity really comes from. Creativity brings the adaptability uh, for us to survive the environment. And a lot of the discussion has happened before, and we've touched on what a VUCA environment is. You know, this volatile, uncertain area that, such as the COVID pandemic, uh, quite a number of speakers said that one of the major challenges they've had over the past couple of years was COVID and how the business had to change. But really, creativity and innovation allowed and the embracing of technology allowed companies to survive. Um, and some of that creativity has remained in some of the companies. Some has taken the step back and gone back to their ways of before. But the creativity is the catalyst for growth. Um, and one of the things I mentioned before is uh, creativity is also one of the only ways that we can get over cognitive fixedness, which is a way of, and it's an easy trap to fall into. Uh, it's a situation where we feel comfortable with how things were done in the past, and we actually gravitate towards that. And I've been in many management meetings, board meetings, that I've been lucky enough to be interacting with quite a bit of seasoned professionals, experienced members of the board who has decades of experience. But the challenge is, is that when you have that amount of experience in your room and uniformity on your board, is that we all think the same way. And we end up towards a group think, making an easy choice, and sometimes departing from creativity. So it's just a, a, um, the introduction of creativity on the board would allow us probably to get away from that group thing. Now, companies would stagnate with all creativity. Yeah? And within Governance Week, there's been a lot of thought-provoking conversations, inspiring messages, um, guiding us in the right direction. Now, uh, true success and failures, and you see from my bio that I've been involved in a lot of organizational transformation, um, business development. Not all has been successful. Not every in, um, initiative that we've tried has worked. But we've come up with, and when I say we, I mean myself and the company that I'm involved with, some uh, steps, some um, measures that would help unstagnate, I know that's not a word, but to try to get that flow um, going of creativity and innovation. And it really starts with the people. And the first thing is focus on your people, getting the right leadership. Now, personally, I believe enthusiasm is infectious. So having the right attitude, having diverse boards, having diverse leadership, having diverse teams, having a right mix of employees, um, inculcating the right attitude, it allows you to look at the problems facing the, the companies um, in different ways and allows you to come up with more innovative solutions, more out of the box thinking. Now, a lot coming with having the right team is developing the team, focusing on training, education, awareness, you know, uh, having an appreciation for what we don't know. You now, I've been fortunate to spend uh, quite a number of my years with, um, with Massey, uh, I think over 14 years I spent with Massey. And so, you know, having Massey as the platinum sponsor and hang, um, seeing the video at, after every session was quite nostalgic for me. But one of the things that within Massey that I was fortunate to be is that there is a lot of development of people. Um, they, and I believe now they've actually started, uh, and Ajahn could probably confirm, the uh, Massey University, which is all about training and developing people. And the reality is, is the more training that you're involved in is the more you understand how much you don't know. And it allows you to pursue more knowledge, more learning. And what that is, is you have more ideas coming into your room to bring creative solutions that is probably cross industry, cross function, cross country, that really allows you to, to tackle some of the problems that 
moving towards um, a circular economy would have. Now, uh, also one of the things that um, have is always been a challenge for me and a lot of the companies I work with is creating a, a culture of failure. Because, and uh, I think Lorenzo touched on it earlier in the first session, in fostering a culture of experimentation. The challenge I've had in most companies in trying to get this done is that it art always comes at a cost. And sometimes we don't want to budget for that cost because allowing, and it, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You try to encourage people to try things, but then you don't necessarily want to celebrate the failures. But I found that in, in areas that you actually plan for the failure, you budget for the failure, you uh, understand that risk beforehand, and you know that it's exploratory ex ex experimentation that you have some of the greatest leaps um, in performance. You have some of the, the greatest uh, innovative and innovations coming out, whether it's a new process, whether it's a, um, a new uh, customer experience. It, it's just so new coming out from that diverse um, group and that uh, I think that safety net of knowing that the repercussion for failure is that you get to try a next way rather than termination, um, which is a reality in some companies. Uh, one of the other things that works well for us is a continuous engagement with the market and stakeholders, keeping abreast of what's out there, looking at the market, looking at trends, looking at technologies, and, and AI came up on quite a few sessions before, how it will impact the business, what are the risks, how, how can it be a creative tool to drive innovation, how can we work together to enhance the service to the customer. So there's a continuous market, market scanning that will allow us to bring a better level of service to the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that's worked for us is strategizing sustainability, having that at all levels of the organization, but more importantly, at the board level, planning for it, budgeting for it, a time, uh, assigning time and resources to work on projects and innovative ideas apart from the regular day. And what comes with that is implementing the proper systems tracking and reporting, which would sound like the least exciting one, but it's the one that allows you to verify um, where you're heading. So a lot of the uh, companies, a lot of the initiatives we've taken, is putting in the right software, enterprise system, live tracking, dynamic reporting, live dashboards, having access to information that it would allow you to make the right decisions when needed. Um, allowing Which, you to- I, I yeah. think that you are trying to give us the solutions now because <laughs> it was bad sharing what all those challenges were at the start. But I wanted to tell you that I thought that that was a really good idea because a lot of what you have said does align to a great extent with what Lorenzo presented this morning. Mm -hmm. And it would have seemed so easy and so simple as he shares it in terms of what we need to do. So I don't want you to feel bad because the clear question would have been, well, if it's so easy and these are the steps, why aren't we doing it? So yeah. you have actually been able to raise for us what are some of those challenges? So I don't want you to move away from that too quickly. <laughs> Let me <laughs> come back and you can explore afterwards what the, the solutions and strategies may be. Right. But for now, let me invite Eleanor so we can get from her, her take in terms of how we could build that creativity and innovation to ensure that we are getting sustainability in our organization. And, and for sure, as you can see from her, her profile and background, she do, she's an expert. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Kamla. Um, it's my pleasure, pleasure to share the, the panel with with. Vishnu and Anjin, and I'm going to take a very different approach from what we have been doing, and not disconnected, but I wanted us to think a little bit outside of, of the box, so to speak, and the box in terms of where we have been going all day. And let me start by thanking you, Kamla, for, for inviting me to participate in this conference week. It's been an, a very stimulating at the opening session and you know the session I wasn't able to join yesterday but certainly today 
and very robust. I've learned a lot, opened my eyes to a lot of things, and, and that's good because it's important to keep to keep learning, as as you know. And I and so I, I want to congratulate the CCGI. I want to congratulate you, Madam CEO, your directors, your team for coming up with this theme in the first place, and then pulling together the, the presenters to, to deal with this um, diverse, the many diverse aspects and to talk to the, what, what I would call the multivariate aspects of, of circularity. And so we talk about a circular world governing for future generations. Um, it's it's people focus as Mark had indicated and several others talking about it in different ways. And just to say, as we talk about working for future generations, the concept of intergenerational equity was introduced at the World Conference, the first World Conference on Environment and Development, which popularly came to be popularly known as, as Rio in, um, in 1992. Um, and at, at that time, um, the concept of sustainable development was also articulated, talking about how do we um, um, how do we live today, use the resources today, without compromising the ability of future generations to have a healthy planet and healthy lifestyle? So we we have come a long way, and we have been working at this for for years. And now that we have climate change and the implications of climate change upon us, it has positioned some of the concepts in a, in a slightly um, different way. So now we are coming together to, and that, that whole business of the sustainable development, bringing together environment and development was, was really hoisted to bring what were previously considered uh, mutually exclusive um, domains. Um, those of us who are involved um, have preached and practiced that you bring together, you harmonize development and the environment. And there is a symbiotic relationship between where we are now focused on people, planet, and prosperity. So as we contemplate this developing innovation and creativity for sustainable governance, looking towards the future, I would like for us to consider the interrelatedness of population growth, urbanization, and the major planetary crises that have stimulated this drive towards circularity. And those crises are climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And what we need to ask, what action must we take? Well, where, where do we move? So if we, if we focus on, on urbanization and the business of adaptation and resilience, because we've, we've talked a lot about energy and the net zero and mitigation and reducing greenhouse gases. But for us in the Caribbean, adaptation and building resilience is critical and mark among others, but more recently, really emphasized. And, um, and so did um, Ian from Angostura in terms of some of what they were doing. But Mark really zeroed in on the fact that building, putting in adaptation, putting in resilience is critical. And for companies, for the corporate sector, if we're talking circularity, if we're talking really what circularity is all about, we have to bring this into, into account. And so to repeat the three elements, design, which is um, which was which was mentioned this morning by Lorenzo, I think. He focused on design and, and, and using design. And, and for, for the MacArthur Foundation, it is designing waste and pollution out of systems. Then there is the business of utilizing resources to their highest potential value. And then the third, which, which is very important, all of them are important, obviously, and all of them are related, is to um, build 
um, nature take care of natural capital and re regenerate natural systems. And what I would like to, to put before us to, to remind ourselves that the circular economy is really about driving economic growth by maximizing resource efficiency and minimizing environmental impact. And what better way, what a better place than to look at the urban environment, which we, for the most part, corporate sectors occupy, which we have an influence on, we pull resources, we discharge um, waste, we discharge pollution, we destroy natural capital. What should we be doing? And we need to be innovative, creative, and perhaps the innovation and the creativity, I would like to suggest, lies in our focus or taking on board this urban environment in which, in which we, uh, which we habit, which we inhabit, right? Um, and uh, in, in, at the turn of the century, turn of 1900, which is a century ago, um, we had fewer than one in six persons occupying urban space, maybe 17% less. Um, by 2050, it is projected that we will have four out of six persons living in urban centers. What does that say to us? And if uh, just pulling on a, a quotation from, from Great Britain, their brand, great brands that says, today's cities prioritize cars and commerce over community and climate. And in order to survive, whether we survive or cities survive, we have to ensure that the social and the ecological good begin to take some priority. To achieve future cities, the world needs its citizens need to act, its businesses need to act. We need leaders in policy, which would be our government. We need leaders in industry and we need our communities. And what we're having is social and environmental concerns in this increasingly hostile climate as urban population grows changes have to be made, right? So we ask what will cities look like in 2050 and how will we as corporate sector play a role? And again, if we think of the cycles of life and I'm trying to go back to some of what we, we heard, uh, the cycles of life are very manifest in the urban ecosystem. And um, I think Lorenzo, I get the names right anyway, talked about the design of the circular system. And if we really think of that, we can, we can extend that because the globe itself is circular. All the issues are transboundary, cross-boundary, all the issues that we're dealing with, the air, the pollution, the, the climate systems, everything is the biodiversity, cross-boundary. And if we think of urban ecosystems, what have we seen? We have seen a transformation of natural areas. Perhaps we might call it degradation of natural areas, which have been replaced. And, and those natural areas have become highly degraded. Poor planning, soils are sealed, little space for vegetation. We have rapid runoff. We, I know it in Trinidad very well. And you know it in Trinidad very well. We have it in Jamaica very well. We have it in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have it in all our territories. And um, roads, waste and emissions from industry, traffic, homes, polluting. So we want to, I would suggest, one of the creative, innovative things we need to begin to look at is how we restore our urban ecosystems. How do we use our companies? How do we use our production to try to restore these urban ecosystems? Um, and cities, of course, if you're looking at circularity, innovation is one. We have to invest in innovative infrastructure and, and skills. And there are some places which have 
local business improvement districts. I believe you have it in Port of Spain, certainly in London, in New York, and we have it in, in, in Kingston. You know, there are other places, but local, and this again now is a creative and perhaps innovative, although some of it has started in other places long ago, but we want to expand on, on that. And if I could share a, a play again on the word, the creativity in Kingston, one of the, the interesting things that um, has been happening, we have a, a group that's called Kingston Creative, and it is an attempt to um, revitalize a section of downtown Kingston. And they're doing it through the arts, painting of murals involving initially youth in those inner, some of those inner city communities and companies, of course, very involved because they're making this space, their wall space available. And, and, then, it, and then it involves also a certain amount of public private partnership because that's the other thing that we have to, to think about. Companies pushing to work in partnership with government as well as with, with communities. So we're talking about, and, and we mentioned collaboration earlier. And we, we, we want systemic change. We have, to, we have to move through the systems. And what I would like to put on the table also is that we need to focus on systems. The, uh, the, the integration of the many parts that make up the city, many parts, many parts that make up our operating environment. If it's a company, it can be just your immediate borders, or it can be the community in which you operate, or it can be the entire country. So the issues, as I said before, are transboundary, and we need to move. And I want to share a very what I consider an, an interesting uh, viewpoint, and it relates to the redrawing of boundaries and the building of bridges. And the point is that um, existing boundaries between different systems and between different actors can create barriers. And, and we need to try to redefine our purpose to try and bring down, break down some of these barriers. The boundary in a general sense is a means of delineating one area from another, but as we have said, organizational or system boundary provides clarity, you know, we know where we're working. However, many of the issues cross these boundaries and therefore we can't, we have to try to perhaps redraw the boundary, but more important, more importantly, build a bridge um, to, to cross the boundaries. And that requires collaboration between the many different partners, collaboration across sectors and industries and so on. And in um, creating the conditions for these organizations and industries to collaborate, we have to take, it is suggested, and this is what I want to share, that we take inspiration from living bridges. Some of you perhaps already know about living bridges. These are bridges which have emerged over years, weaving together the roots of living trees in a process sometimes referred to as tree shaping. I don't have any visual to show you, but it really is very impressive. As the trees grow, the roots increasingly become intertwined with one another, creating bridges which are alive. These bridges can be particularly strong and resilient to the shifting environment, and they are constantly evolving, and under the right conditions, they grow stronger year by year, living bridges. So when, when um, thinking about the special skills that are required to build these living bridges, there are a few characteristics that appear to be present. And we're drawing the analogy now between our innovation and creativity for companies as we go towards the future and these living bridges. So what are they? Vision, trees don't see, of course, but then we don't know that they don't see, but they see me perhaps in a different way. So you need vision. We believe that living bridge builders must be able to see the bigger picture. You have to look at the, the whole in a holistic way and 
to anticipate how best to shape the roots so that they weave together strongly. So as we are marching towards this transformation, as we are marching towards this future, this innovation for future generations, we, we need a vision of the, the big picture vision. And then we need a certain amount of dexterity. How do we, as a young people now say, how do you flex, right? Um, bring together the different roots and the branches to create these bridges. So you also have to support, um, you know, the, the, the process. You need patience, right? So that's vision, dexterity, patience, because it can take many years. And, and this comes back to the point that was made earlier about short-term, medium-term, long-term, many years to achieve, or depending on what, what you're trying to achieve, the, but you need patience. So you have to focus on the long-term horizon while you perhaps achieve shorter-term gains. And then we have to have a certain amount of humility, a good deal of humility, because living bridges are about the trees, the roots, the branches, the role of the bridge builder is to shape the relationships, the relationships that you need so that they become strong and deeply interconnected. So it's just a new way of talking about partnerships, new way of talking about how we work together, interconnected, and the fact that we need to be humble, we need to be have a certain amount of dexterity, we need to be patient, we need to have a sense of, of where, we, where we're going. We believe that these skills are consistent with those necessary to develop organizations that transcend boundaries. Living bridge builders focus on weaving together the relationships that are needed to drive the collaboration required to enable system change. So you have a common purpose, we have leadership, we work with the business processes, we understand the risks, and we have practical implications. And I want to just um, end by sharing a, a very interesting um, comment that was made, and many of you, I'm sure, would know Ambassador Dennis Francis, who is your um, Trinidadian, um, has been a Trinidadian High Commission, and, and right, and he has just been. Um, elected to chair the, the 50th United Nations General Assembly. Big honor for Trinidad and Tobago and for us in the Caribbean. And I was listening, I have a particular interest because I know him very well from his days as a student. And I, he ended his um, inaugural speech, so to speak, by with the Latin phrase, um, soli Deo Gloria. And he said, of course, Soli Deo Gloria is to God alone is the glory. And he said, just look at it. Soli Deo Gloria, S-D-G. And so he was drawing that analogy with the SDGs, which is underpinning a lot of what we are talking about. And so I thought I would just share that with you from Ambassador Dennis Francis to the Trinidad and Tobago Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eleanor. You know, I, I feel bad for the people who missed hearing you this evening. This was such a, a wonderful and refreshing perspective uh, uh, as well that's given us new food for thought in terms of how we can look at this notion of sustainability and understand it and approach it differently. So I know we are going to have quite a bit to talk about the, the tree shaping. I, I found that an amazing analogy. So, but before we, we get to the conversation, I now want to invite our third panelist, and Jen, I know as the chief risk officer, a lot of what you would um, be looking at is uh, some of what Vishnu raised as well. You know, what are those concerns that prevents us from being able to do things? But I'm, I'm happy to, to give you the floor and to hear from you, your contribution in terms of how we build sustainable organizations using creativity and innovation. 
Um, so thank you very much to the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute for um, inviting me to this panel. Um, I feel humbled by my panelists that I can share the stage with them. Um, and already in their presentations, I've learned so much. I've made some notes on um, areas that I can also incorporate in, into this area. So um, thank you so much. And it really is um, very humbling to be in, in this audience. Um, I spent a lot of time reflecting on the theme of today's um, panel, Sustainable Governance, Creativity, Innovation. And it so happened that um, this week we have been working on our ESG framework at Massey. Um, so I guess I was in that mindset to really think through um, a lot of the things, how can I communicate what I'm actually practicing and really bring that uh, together to this space. I think one of the first things that comes to mind when I pull this apart and as a risk manager, I tend to be a bit analytical, so bear with me a bit. Um, some sustainable governance requires an intentional mindset. Um, I always go back to the definition of governance, how we manage business how we manage business well. So in that, we really starting with objective setting. And if sustainability is the goal, then it is an objective setting. We need to set objectives where sustainable um, outcomes are produced. So how does that look different to what we do? Well, I think traditionally the corporation speaks about the stakeholder, um, profit targets, revenue targets, growing market share. And sustainable governance, I think, requires us to think about how we achieve those objectives. So it's really going into looking at the products we produce, the stakeholders we engage with, um, the customers to really attach long-term sustainability to all that we do. So it really is integrated. And I think it's one of the reasons that ESG is in compliance. It is in strategic objectives. It is in risk management. So it really is infused throughout the organization if that's the objective. And then I thought about I thought about purpose-led businesses. Um, so Massey is a company that has been very vocal in saying that it wants to be judged and held accountable as a purpose-led business. Um, and conscious capitalism was one of um, those sayings um, when I was recruited uh, by Massey as chief risk officer. Um, I remember having a, a conversation with our CEO and president, Gervais Warner. He said, you know, read this book, Conscious Capitalism. And, we, and he, behind him were some values. Um, one which stood out was love and care. And that confused me coming from a traditional background. I wanted to know what these people were, sm were smoking. And then you could see from the video how we've progressed. I mean, now we're singing, dancing like true hippies. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but um, in that book, and it's Conscious Capitalism by Raj, Raj Maki and Raj Sisodia, um, Conscious capitalism really starts with articulating a clear and authentic long-term purpose. And so that really speaks to, um, I think chimes in with um, Eleanor's points on really having a very holistic approach defining what success looks like. Um, one of the remarkable stories in, in that book is how the American constitution was founded. Um, some of the founding fathers, uh, Jefferson, Adam Smith, they actually looked to Native Americans when they, they were developing. And it's natural, right? Those were their neighbors. And they had come into a society that had been there for hundreds of years that had, um, and they were coming from Europe where things, you know, from a technology perspective were more advanced. And here are these people who could, um, withstand the cold, withstand the harsh conditions while their people were dying out like flies. So it's natural that they were very curious to really understand what have they done or what are they doing that they can sustain civilization for many centuries 
And as we now approach our own constitution, so they were only they were going through their um, corporate governance summit <laughs> at the time. What can we learn from them? And what they saw across many of the tribes was that their system of governance included room for personal freedoms, um, included a voting system through consensus. And most importantly, they gave women a large role in government, in the government of the tribes. That was something that the founding fathers of American constitution left out. But guess what? Whatever it is you, you miss out is waiting for you down the road. Um, just as this conversation on SDGs, it's been a long time coming. So we lost our way. If you look back at our founding civilizations, Africa, India, that's where we started. And so through a crisis, which is, you know, we can't ignore what is coming through social disruption, what is coming through the attention to the climate. This is now waiting for us and said, listen, you avoided this all this time. Here it is again. And then one of the um, other components I thought very relevant to this is whenever a decision was made, it had to be made through consensus. And you must think about the impact for two generations later. Isn't that sustainable governance? So I think there is a lot for us to think about as we put frameworks in place that mindset of being very intentional of a broader set of stakeholders than we have traditionally thought of, but really infusing business making strategy and risk management with a new lens. And it's not an add on. It's just we have to do business differently. So innovation and creativity, and I know Lorenzo very well, so it's really um, great to hear, to hear him being talked about in, in this forum. Um, I've attended his sessions as well. Very early in my career as a risk manager, I had that aha moment in attending his workshops to infuse innovation and creativity in my risk management practice. Um, and he would tell you that, you know, creativity is that spark of ideas um, that as humans, we just naturally have. We can't not be creative because we are learning beings and we're curious. So whether we can control it or not, we just produce creativity. But innovation is something different. It's really our ability to implement, to take creativity and then implement it into something um, useful. So I want you to think about those two separately because they do have relevance to when we think of putting, in, putting together the hallmarks of uh, governance that is sustainable. When we marry creativity and innovation, I think Vishnu, you sent it, we don't always get results that result in sustainability. And you can look at the evolution of, um, of human, human history, you know, what we have produced that is so amazing and so beautiful. Uh, this morning, I like to listen in the mornings, I like to listen to classical music with my kids and then followed with some 80s pop and, and finish off. <laughs> and when you think about that, we have been able to create such diversity in music. Um, think about the steel pan and all discarded oil drum. So we can't not, we can't help but be creative. Our challenge is to do creativity and innovation in a different way, in a way that produces results that sustain generations upon generations. And that's a challenge for us. Um, so how can creativity and innovation be harnessed in the service of sustainable governance? So as a risk practitioner, I would always say ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, has a role to play. Um, because it helps with objective setting. I say strategy and risk management are two sides of the same coin. You can't do risk management without knowing, you know, what is the strategic objective. Risk management is just putting things in place to ensure that your strategic objectives are met. 
So with an intentional mindset around defining strategic objectives that um, are broad and inclusive and have sustainability as its guiding light, then the risk management framework is aligned because that's what we are managing for. And, and it sounds very simple, but uh, certainly when we think of ESG, ESG has to be incorporated into the risk management framework as well as strategy and compliance because it's changing the way we see how business is being managed. It's integrated into the fiber of the entire organization. It's not an add-on. So applying a risk-based approach rather a controls-based approach is a great way of, a pre of approaching this challenge. Why do I say as opposed to controls-based? Well, controls-based approach leads to a compliance tick box, very narrow, defined, silo approach. And that's where a lot of creativity can be stifled or thwarted because life has to emerge. And so creativity has to emerge. So if you put me in this box, I'm gonna find a way. And what comes to mind is a lot of crises that we've had. And a lot of the crises, the great financial crisis, the recent SVB crisis, what you saw was that creativity not being confined uh, by the, the reg strict regulatory um, parameters that were placed. A risk-based approach requires real deep understanding of what's at stake. I always say um, we're really good at identifying risk, not so good at quantifying the impact. Hmm. And it's in quantifying the impact if we have a lot of education of what it means from a financial perspective, rep reputational, regulatory, impact to the environment, we can broaden what impact really means. And when we do that, then it's like taking, um, you know, those, and I'm, I'm dating myself here. Uh, you remember those color tubes when you needed to, to adjust the, the lens a bit to see the different patterns? Things become clearer when we, when we apply a, a risk-based approach to this program. Um, Enterprise risk management also allows us to use risk appetite as the mechanism the organization uses to set parameters. So I think of this in two ways, um, pressure does bust pipe. So that's the saying in Trinidad we have, <laughs> when you put um, constraints too tight, you get creativity. Risk appetite is another perspective, which is guardrails. So risk appetite, guardrails that you set, if like in Jamaica, in Trinidad, we have many winding roads. You need those guardrails mm -hmm. because when you want to go very fast around those bends, there is something to protect you falling off. So risk appetite is a great mechanism that the organization can use to articulate what is acceptable and through risk impact, those thresholds become integrated into the organization so that somebody at the top doesn't have to make sure everybody's doing this. Everybody becomes a custodian of sustainable practices. So what are some of the other constraints I think that uh, cause you know, um, creativity uh, to flourish culture? Um, resources, I think Vishnu talked about that, technology, cost of living, social cohesion, these are all external to the organization, but there's sometimes the constraints that we say, see as barriers to this new approach of sustainable governance. But if you look through history at different cultures from you know, Egyptian, and you can tell I'm a history buff, I like this, but what fascinates me a lot is that the amount of creativity you have in spite of all these constraints that we now complain about. So I'd like to encourage us to think of these um, not as constra constraints, but as opportunities to let creativity really flourish. And I say that because it usually comes up in the boardroom 
and in the management room when you know people like myself um, are advocating for a different way of doing business. Um, oh, the culture of the organization won't allow that. Oh, we don't have the resources. Yeah, but through intentional objective setting that sets your North Star, this is there, that's where you really emphasize what sustainable governance is. I hear what you're saying, but this, these are our strategic objectives. This is the way we're gonna start doing business. Um, I think the other thought that comes to mind is really around diversity of perspectives. What does that mean? Well, um, think of the Caribbean, think of the carnival, the mass, our food, our culture, where does that come from? Well, we've had European ancestors, we've had African, Indian, Chinese, and depending on what country you go to, the mix changes and out of that mix really comes an expression of who we are. And the same way in the organization, getting different perspectives and through the board and senior management, creating forums and avenues to ensure that there is a variety of perspective and a lot. So not just in variety, but in quantity. So how that works in, in, in my space is really building in a lot of feedback mechanisms and then assessment of who are the stakeholders making decisions. So who does the change impact? And are the stakeholders impacted by the change having a voice in the creation of the solutions? And when we look across the room, do we have representation across the organization? Because when I develop a policy, I'm not always the person affected by that policy. I really require other people to be part of that. And that's important when we're bringing in new changes and new ways of doing business, which is what sustainable governance is going to require. This is a huge change management challenge, um, but bringing people to the table and making sure they are part of that objective setting, risk uh, identification and mitigation is going to ensure you have more sustainable solutions and is gonna help in the innovation part, how we implement or how we channel creativity. Um, permission, so this is a little bit about culture, permission to co-create. And that I think Vishnu mentioned biases that um, as Caribbean people, I think we have our own brand of, of bias based on class, based on ethnicity. This is an opportunity for us to look at ourselves and really create spaces where we can um, heal ourselves uh, because some of those biases come from trauma in the past where, you know, because of class or race or, or, or whatever, that is formed from our own um, Caribbean context, our own historical journey that inhibits that innovation. So we have an opportunity and a challenge as leaders in the organization to educate ourselves first. Biases, um, gender bias in, in the board, I think, is, is a big one that we don't call out enough because, oh, we shouldn't say that. Um, mm. As women, we want to be evaluated based on, on you know, our work. Um, just today that came up. I said, yeah, but when you are promoting someone based on um, what they've produced and the result is always a, a man in senior leadership positions, then there is bias. So the challenge with a lot of the SDG, ESG um, objectives that you seem these are no brainers, we can go, at, go after this. What you bounce up against is really um, the biases that uh, things have always been done this way. And that fear of you know, calling out areas where we have fallen short or where we need to progress relative to what is required to really have sustainable governance, as opposed to, you know, traditionally what we have. And, um, um, you know, we, we, we know ourselves in a, in a Caribbean governance structure. Um, 
there is optimism as well that we need to embrace in this. So optimism and positivity we associate maybe with a sort of more North American um, culture, but I would like us, and I, I listen to Mia Motley who brings that fire, but optimism, bravery and courage to call out um, um, the status quo, but certainly a lot of optimism and that fuels confidence. So those are some of the two areas of the culture that we need to um, nurture and encourage in our staff. So when we create that, that goes to excitement that creates a very healthy environment for positive creativity, positive innovation. So for me, innovation involves implementing or harnessing creativity to create value. And that requires discipline through risk management. So having a formal enterprise risk management framework is one of the tools from a governance perspective that organizations can implement to develop that discipline. And I'm gonna draw on my experience a little bit. When I started at Massey, I, um, I worked with the companies where they had to implement ERM, the regulatory bodies. Um, and my challenge there was that um, tension between a compliance mindset and really looking at what ERM can bring to enhance strategy. As the group matured and enterprise risk management was rolled out in non-regulatory areas, um, our Massey stores, motors, et cetera, then I really had to make a strong business case. Well, what's the value that you were bringing here? So value creation, that, that focus on value creation meant that I had to come really good with bringing solutions, risk mitigation solutions that they saw could be both sustainable but made business sense to them. So some of that might have been bringing a lot of technology into organizations that were still, um, and this is pre-pandemic, that was still very paper-based. And I think that's true for many Caribbean organizations. And with that innovation, um, I was able to then have a, a seat at the table to then have broader conversations on strategy and governance. So I think the approach to this has to be very practical, um, step by step, bringing solutions that wins the audience over with um, solutions that are giving value to the organization. And that might mean you know, alleviating the burden on the employee or the department that has been doing things one way and now can do, um, uh, do processes, procedures in a way that's a lot more efficient. But at the same time, it's like putting spinach in, your, in, in, in the food. At the same time, they are doing sustainability. So sometimes we do need to step back and push forward solutions that we know makes good business sense. One example, sorry, did you, yeah. <laughs> did you have a question? No. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Anjan, because we are actually into um, the last half hour, which is when we will normally engage um, with uh, participants for our Q&A segment as well. Um, so if it's okay, I'd, I'd want to go into that section now and, and invite um, Vishnu and Eleanor to, 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 to join us here um, because I, I wanted to take this opportunity um, as it is that we, we didn't, um, as I'm, I'm moderating the panel today, um, and to share this and to, to ask you, how can we achieve it? Because each of you have presented really three amazing different viewpoints in terms of um, the challenges, the possible solutions, and how different things can work together to achieve um, having that, that innovation, which would lead to the sustainability that we want. Now, so in my research, so I would have learned from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, what are some of the, the practical things that impacts people's lives? And then I want us to take it all the way now to the top to governance and see how we find that relationship. So 
Um, let's say, for instance, uh, you have everyone wants to have their own car. Everyone, some somehow own three or four different vehicles. Okay, uh, but the research showed that cars are parked ninety percent of the time, and and when you think about it, it makes sense. You you get up on the morning and you drive to work. The majority of us, the car remains parked all day for hours, and then you take it to drive home. You may run an errand, but then it parks all night before you get up again to, to go. So one of the question is, do we really all need to own our own vehicles or is there some different thing that we could think about? So Eleanor, that's a little bit with the systematic, um, systemic thinking. How do we align different things? Another one that really resounded with me, let me put it to, to um, our smartphones because all of us have smartphones, some of us have two. Right, you have your personal one and then you have your, your corporate. Smartphones are upgraded almost every year with, with manufacturers. And they use a lot of materials, a lot of resources go into there. And then these are just discarded when you want an upgrade. Now, smartphones are relatively easy. Let's talk about things like a, a washing machine. You know, it's, it's an appliance where now... I would recall, and I don't hide my age, <laughs> when my parents' generation would have bought a, a washing machine, if, if they ever did, it would be with intention that this is going to last the whole generation of the family. And everyone knew something goes wrong, it can be fixed. And, and even if you didn't have an expert fixer, there was an expert in the house who will find a way to make it work. That was the level of, of thinking that went into the, the type of living that we had. The last 50 years or so, however, has we've been pushed into a level of consumerism that is unprecedented. And so we, we need now to figure out a way to come back to how do we re use our resources in such a way that we are not just making disposables. It, not everything is just going to be a one-time use and discarded, short-term use and then discarded. That, that is one of the real challenges facing us. So, so Vishnu, I wanted to, to come to you first because I, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity because you know, you, you're really very honestly identified what some of the challenges are. And as, as you said, a lot of us are, are hesitant to take risks because we are more comfortable with sticking with how things work. When we talk about building this kind of sustainability, this kind of circular economy, you are talking about fundamentally redesigning the way we have been, we have been behaving for the last generation or so. How do we approach that to ensure that we can convince from the boardroom level that we don't want to manufacture a billion phones or 500 million washing machines because each one is going to bring its, its profit to us. How do we move to this new way of thinking where you want to, to put the responsibility back to the manufacturers, back into the boardroom? that the focus has to be you design for reuse rather than design for use and discard. Ooh. It's a tough one, but I don't have <laughs> No, because it, it, it's, uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things we looked at there. Um, and, but I'm, I'm tackling the last question, which is how do we influence the board or decision makers to, um, Manufacture for reuse rather than replace. I know that that that's counterintuitive to how most businesses operate, right? It, um, and when we speak sustainability, we have to address the fact that honestly, although there's a higher purpose and purpose-driven organizations, at the end of the day, if they're not doing it profitably, which is also sustainability, uh, it won't be done. So 
having that conversation is a difficult one and it's showing that um and i'll actually draw reference to anjan's uh comment when they uh, the drafting the constitution in that they were drafting for two generations later it's bringing that level of realization to the decision makers and it's a it's a um it's a strategy we use in, in dealing with one-on-one -on -one persons as well. The way you get people to buy onto your strategy, the way they're heading is making it personal to them. Tell how they will benefit or their children or their grandchildren will benefit. And if you can paint a picture of a world that they are now living in with better resources, a better way of being that's more sustainable. Um, because as Elmo mentioned, you're designing a world without waste and, and pollution, right? So bring all those together you're painting a picture that the board will uh, want to live in, or want their children to live in, and let them buy into that and hold them in that space through all your senior discussions and decision making. So that's how I would approach it. Eleanor? It's a, a difficult one. Um, Vishnu, that you know, I agree. I agree with, with what you have said. I think we would also have to focus on, on trying to get them to look at research, trying to get them to look forward. Um, you, you mentioned the transport and, and, and one of the things that no, that is being talked about is, you know, shared services, people, this, the, um, the Ubers and the all these things so that people are not driving and the Airbnb, you don't own a hotel, but um, it, it's working. It, it's a new way of thinking. So the, the research and the infrastructure that is needed to, to make it happen, which would be one of the things that would probably be a pushback, Vishnu, from how do we get this? How, do, how will it be supported? So I would say, um, and then of course, the business of the washing machine, we know that what is referred to as planned obsolescence, you know, we, we do it for five years so that we can sell more. Um, that's uh, that's a new way. So you'd have to have like a, a higher value where they would be earning more um, with with less. But it's it's a tough one. And and I think it it, it would require the, the science behind, you know, the infrastructure research. What do we need to make? This is where we want to go. Do some research, come tell us. But then you have to have a, a very enlightened board too who will want to, to do that. Many, many persons want short term. Uh, they don't look long term. They don't look for the greater good either. And, and, and that is, is how do we get all of those pieces together? I don't know. It's a toughie. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it depends on, on, on what your particular product is, because yeah. I remember um, years ago when I was doing my MBA program, we had this example of um, Schindler's, I think yeah, it's Schindler's elevators. I, I could be wrong yeah. with the name, but yeah. the whole notion of the elevator. Now, you don't go replacing an elevator every five years or even every 10 years. Mm -hmm. so what you do is you, you build that to ensure that it lasts and what the company was able to do to ensure that it continued to be profitable was it ensured it developed the know-how to fix. So it was the services afterwards that would have brought mm -hmm. in money. So, you know, it's the, that kind of thinking that exists. It's how do we now apply it in these concepts. But Anjan, let's, let's hear from you as well. What are your thoughts on this? So I'm going to wear my change management hat um, <laughs> to answer this. Um, it starts with really being clear on, on what we want to achieve. So to lean into um, Vishnu's response, if we are serious about um, uh, doing things or being purpose-led, purpose-driven, then it does require that commitment first for the board. And then it's two things. It's awareness of what's the benefit and that might be long term for the next generation but i say follow the money what is the cost of not changing now and i think a lot of these solutions um, work when we start measuring the negative impact on us at a personal level so post pandemic you don't have to make as strong a case for working from home 
not many people want to drive in. They did it, they all did it before, but because they had the experience and the pleasure and benefit of, and, and now the permission, and then companies saw, wow, we can still get the productivity and get higher employee engagement. So they understood the, the impact. And I would say spend some time measuring the negative impact of not taking a different approach. Um, so in, in, in terms of um, having uh, the cars uh, clogging up uh, the roads because everybody wants a car, what does that cost in, as we have seen this evening, having to go through a lot of traffic when there's a lot of um, rain, what does that cost in health? What does that cost at a personal level? What does that cost in productivity? And we don't spend, as I said, we're very good at risk identification. We're not very good at the quantification. And I think that data, when it's in a business context, gives a good um, business case for change. Uh, today, I saw that we have new washing machines that are washing machine and dryer <laughs> combined. <laughs> Why would a company do that? They're going to lose money. But obviously, they have seen that there is a benefit. Consumers are asking for solutions that align to that objective. And that has been this incentive. And then they're probably going to get a leap on their competition. So I think it's really focusing on what's the benefit, but what is the cost if we don't change? And then that can go into a really strong business case. Thank you very much, Andrea. Now, um, Eleanor, you, you shared with us what I think was such an excellent uh, analogy, the, um, the living bridges, where the, the roots of the trees are, are shaped so that over time, they, they find and get stronger and stronger so that you can have that living bridge which can last generations. And, and this tied in a little bit to, to what Anjan shared and, and, and Vishnu referred to it to the, the US constitution and what really would have inspired them to know how to create what those rules were that would last two generations down. So we know that what we want to do is achieve that long-term objective. But it comes back to, to one, one of my questions earlier today in, in that, Yes, it, we can we can know that we can identify today's needs. There are some needs that we could immediately respond to. But when you are thinking two and three generations down the road, and, and this is the skills part, Eleanor, and you, and you mentioned what were some of those special skills that is required if you are going to build these living bridges? How do we really build that so that we can identify and know two and three generations from now, we are planting the trees, we are crafting the roots in such a way that we are building that strength. It, it comes back, I think, to what we're saying about our objectives and that long-term vision. What is it that we, we want to, to achieve? And who are the players? Um, how, how do we, how do we, bend how do we how how um flexible um can we be how how creative can we be in terms of bringing in the non-traditional because you're going to be you're stepping outside of that box um but i think the vision is 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 critical and and then getting the players and and pulling them together and the, the business of managing change as as Anjan talks about, um, is is would be a part of it, but and being what? patient, of course, because you, right. change management requires patience too. But what I think is the most challenging of all, Eleanor, is humility. Mm -hmm. you that has been one of the qualities, yes. and I think it, it's challenging because all of us want to be stars. All of us want to, to be celebrated as, as being such a great success. But if you are planning for where your outcome is not going to be seen until a generation or two, that is a level of strength of character that we are looking for. Yeah. That's not easily available. Yeah, that's true. And, and we see that in, in so many aspects of 
what we do. We see it with the international agencies. They come in with, you know, as we say, everybody wants to plant the flag. Um, they come in with assistance, you know, after a disaster. And not to mention our political directorates and so on. And that's a global, it's a hum human nature, I guess. But yeah. we don't, we can't shut the door. We have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely true. And so we come to what may be the last point for uh, today. The, the survey is in the chat for persons to, to link and give us a response. By the way, I'm saying my chairman has um, has put on his video. So uh, Nigel, if you want to, to, to make a contribution, we'd love to have you um, join us here. But I was thinking just now that um, we would need people like Anjan and, and, and Vishnu and Eleanor whose specialty is risk, because I'm taking what Eleanor said uh, and, and, and Anjan as well, which is that if we can identify the risk of not doing it, the risk of not changing, and then look to that framework to help us identify how we can achieve the objectives we want. That, that is what I'm thinking. But I, I'd love to hear from you what your thoughts are on, on how we yeah. try to, to, to build this this innovation and creativity into the way we do things for a sustainable organization. And we are talking two generations from now. Yeah, um, I was quite impressed with all the panelists. I mean, I was quite frankly blown away. So I have, I have sent LinkedIn invitations to all three of you. Um, but I was particularly impressed and I see she as a, she's an ex-banker like myself with Anjan and, and her focus on on, on culture as opposed, you know, compliance. What, what is it, the difference between compliance and, help me. See, yeah, so a controls base when controls, you, you go- exactly. Uh, yeah. As very... opposed to purpose and culture. Yeah. And, and, and I think we in the Caribbean, and I don't know what your experience has been since you have returned home to the region, but we have a command and control approach to doing things. And we want to dictate to people and not engage and inspire. And that's a problem because people who are engaged, who are um, excited, don't want to be told what to do. They want a framework, the core values, they want to understand the purpose and then let them go give them the freedom to, to create. And unfortunately, um, that is not the norm. In fact, my article this week is, is going to talk a lot, a lot about that. But the point is that if we don't do that, then the people don't grow and, and the organizations don't flourish. So, so one of the things I tell people all the time is that there are no stupid questions but there are two stupid answers. <laughs> One is, that's not how we do it here. And the <laughs> other is we have never done it like that before. <laughs> but it's time you start. And, and, and for me, that's, that's what we want to encourage more of. So, so Anjan, I, I wish you a lot, a lot of luck. And I think we have to have you back just to talk about this a lot more. Very, I, I, very, ju very I just want to make stuff. one clarification. With that freedom we put in, risk appetite guardrails right? oh, of course so, of course and for me that's where the values come in yeah you know and and the honesty the humility the openness is very important yeah. so i'm not telling you to just r run down the road and do exactly what you want there is a framework and as you said i mean the reason they have brakes on the car is so that you could go a little faster but and and and, and that's where the brakes are in the in the framework yeah. So thank you very much. Very, very, I mean, powerful stuff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One thank of my you most, all. One of my most humbling experiences was when someone said to me, Anjan, just tell us what you want. Don't, don't we'll figure out the how. Um, <laughs> so that, that was a lesson <laughs> well learned. Yeah. And we, right. we, we, we need to do a lot more of that. Yes. 
Now, I'd like to echo the sentiments of my chairman that this really, really was an incredible panel. I really appreciate mm -hmm. three of you and, and all that you shared. So it is 6.30, however. So unfortunately, Vishnu, there's so much I would want to talk to you about as well. And Eleanor, we, we are definitely going to be inviting you guys back. Just know once you're connected here with us at CTGI. <laughs> 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 yes okay so um i'd like to ask each of you to just give us your concluding thoughts as we wrap up um the third panel here on day two of governance week 2023 so let's hear from you first vishnu and then we go to eleanor and end with Angel. okay so i just want to say thanks again and from my last thought is that um big problems don't always require big solutions you know, it's contrary to what we think. Uh, sometimes we think a force has to match the size of the problem and it might be small nudges, continuous nudges, simply changing the conversation can have a phenomenal impact, changing the actions of people and the culture, teams, department. So that's, don't think we need a huge fix right away. So that's, that's my closing remark. That's comforting too. <laughs> 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 and yeah. I, I'll, I'll echo what um, Vishnu has said, and, and again, just putting people at the center and, and recognizing that, you know, we're dealing with human nature, we're dealing with people, and we're dealing with a whole new world today. So it's um, we, we, a lot of change, a lot of diversity, and, um, and we just need to perhaps take it on board. But the, the people focus, I think, is, is important. Yes, thank you. Anjan? So I'm going to borrow key words from, from my um, fellow panelists, humility, um, patience, and deep listening to stakeholders. It's through listening that um, we temper ourselves from becoming carried away by the coolness of creativity. And really through deep listening, really start bringing a lot of inclusion into the process to make change sticky, to make change sustainable. Um, and that sustainability comes when every stakeholder has um, is invested in the process. Thank you. And, and I really like that too, that when all of us are invested in the process, it definitely can um, lead to better outcomes. So I'd like to thank everyone today. We've had quite a rich and awesome day. I'm, I'm seeing some um, very nice complimentary uh, comments in the chat. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, Anjan, it was lovely hearing from you, getting to, to know you. It was you. a pleasure. Yes, Eleanor, I, I was so happy that you knew of us before you've attended some of our <laughs> And now we have been able to benefit from your rich experience. So thank you. We're coming back to you again. <laughs>